and make it rock, yeah. Beyond the basics of deposit taking and loan making for individuals, global banks support companies, institutions and governments. Much of the work of a global bank can be categorised into 1. Helping clients raise money, 2. Helping clients invest and grow, and 3. Helping them to manage their financial risks and flows. When a client needs to raise money, for example, to invest in a new business idea or modernise an existing operation, a bank can help them access funding. They may choose to go to the capital markets. Here, global banks are able to connect those looking to raise capital and those looking to invest. Investors might be other banks, pension funds and asset managers who are looking for a return on the money they hold. Money is raised and transferred in a number of ways, but the key methods are as stocks, a share of the company held by an individual or group, and bonds, a fixed-term loan agreement between both parties. Where these financial instruments are created is called the primary market. Investors may constantly revise the stocks and bonds, the assets they hold, depending on their performance. Where they are sold or traded is called the secondary market. Here, global banks also play a role in connecting buyers and sellers and will help clients with investment decisions that safeguard assets and maximise the financial return. All successful companies are looking to adapt and grow to protect and enhance their financial future. Global banks have a vast amount of knowledge and expertise that can help them. The bank's job is to advise the client and provide them with insights and ideas that can help them plan for the future. This could be advice on restructuring, buying or merging with other companies, diversifying and future-proofing their business. As a client business grows more global and complex, they rely on banks to manage and simplify their financial flows. That extends to help with the complexities of operating and doing business internationally. A bank that has a global footprint is able to manage their financial interests more effectively and give clients a complete picture of their financial risks and health. So these are just the basics of how banks work. To find out more, visit citigroup.com. Beyond the basics of deposit taking and loan making for individuals, global banks support companies, institutions and governments. Much of the work of a global bank can be categorised into 1. Helping clients raise money, 2. Helping clients invest and grow, and 3. Helping them to manage their financial risks and flows. When a client needs to raise money, for example, to invest in a new business idea or modernise an existing operation, a bank can help them access funding. They may choose to go to the capital markets. Here, global banks are able to connect those looking to raise capital and those looking to invest. Investors might be other banks, pension funds and asset managers who are looking for a return on the money they hold. Money is raised and transferred in a number of ways, but the key methods are as stocks, a share of the company held by an individual or group, and bonds, a fixed-term loan agreement between both parties. Where these financial instruments are created is called the primary market. Investors may constantly revise the stocks and bonds, the assets they hold, depending on their performance. Where they are sold or traded is called the secondary market. Here, global banks also play a role in connecting buyers and sellers and will help clients with investment decisions that safeguard assets and maximise the financial return. All successful companies are looking to adapt and grow to protect and enhance their financial future. 
global banks have a vast amount of knowledge and expertise that can help them. The bank's job is to advise the client and provide them with insights and ideas that can help them plan for the future. This could be advice on restructuring, buying or merging with other companies, diversifying and future-proofing their business. As a client business grows more global and complex, they rely on banks to manage and simplify their financial flows. That extends to help with the complexities of operating and doing business internationally. A bank that has a global footprint is able to manage their financial interests more effectively and give clients a complete picture of their financial risks and health. So these are just the basics of how banks work. To find out more, visit citigroup.com. Beyond the basics of deposit taking and loan making for individuals, global banks support companies, institutions and governments. Much of the work of a global bank can be categorised into 1. Helping clients raise money, 2. Helping clients invest and grow, and 3. Helping them to manage their financial risks and flows. When a client needs to raise money, for example, to invest in a new business idea or modernise an existing operation, a bank can help them access funding. They may choose to go to the capital markets. Here, global banks are able to connect those looking to raise capital and those looking to invest. Investors might be other banks, pension funds and asset managers who are looking for a return on the money they hold. Money is raised and transferred in a number of ways, but the key methods are as stocks, a share of the company held by an individual or group, and bonds, a fixed-term loan agreement between both parties. Where these financial instruments are created is called the primary market. Investors may constantly revise the stocks and bonds, the assets they hold, depending on their performance. Where they are sold or traded is called the secondary market. Here, global banks... This is a unique time where we actually meet virtually in a career fair and who would have thought, right, uh, with all that we are going through and the way the world has changed or the current norm. Um, and it's not new for us. We at City, we have uh, a similar experience from the time this whole pandemic had happened. And what we would love to uh, share with you today is some of the um, I, you know, stuff that we have learned or unlearned uh, throughout this period. Together with me, uh, I have uh, some very successful established colleagues uh, from City um, who have, in their own special way, had a unique career trajectory with City. Now, uh, without, without further ado, I would like to introduce them to you. So I've got Steve, Vicky, Christian, 
um, Arif in Victoria. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, what we will do is I would perhaps start with you, Vicky, and if you could just give us a bit of an introduction of yourself. Um, a little bit about your career experience at City, and um, you know, and what you do currently, what your role entails today. Vicky, over. Yeah, to hi. You. Thank you, Sadhvi. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Vicky Viswanathan. So I'm the APEC UAT Testing Group Manager. Um, I joined City uh, in 2008 as a senior analyst for the AML case investigation team. Um, my day-to-day -day operation was primarily focused in performing control checks for the first level investigation by the analyst. It was the first three years that I was uh, literally confined to the AML case review team. Um, and I had lots of opportunity from an operational standpoint. Um, it was in 2011 that I decided to explore the AML world further. So I applied for the position in the data management utility which was a team responsible in looking to the transactional codes for AML. And this was a technical role, which was definitely out of my comfort zone. But it was in this journey, I realized City had a very sound support system in guiding its employees in handling the roles that they newly embark on. There were plenty of resources, the peer supports were amazing, and it helped me navigate my role from an operational person to a technical person. And um, just close to two years post the role, I had a conversation with my management and I said, hey, um, I wanted to explore the various system that gets bundled into a case for an AML investigation. So I requested to join the testing team. And uh, here I am successfully sustaining my role in the UAT team for the last eight years now. Just uh, to touch a little bit on the uh, team, uh, Sadvir. So um, as I was saying, I lead the AML uh, APEC UAT team consisting of 30 odd testers across KL, China, Korea, Taiwan, and Japan. Um, it's a very important team because we perform a lot of proof checks. We test the development and the changes in the AML system before it gets deployed to production users. Some core skills in the UAT team are particularly on the um, software development lifecycle knowledge, some test understanding, and um, definitely good oral written programming language skills, and so on to navigate through the automation um, activities within the team. Yeah, so that's pretty much some. Savir, I think you're on mute. Sorry. Oops, I know. Technology, mind me. Uh, moving on to you, Steve. Thank you, Vicky. Moving on to you, Steve. So if you could just share with us uh, a little about yourself and also your career, three, um, career experience. Sure. Thank you, Sabia. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So my name is Steve. I'm actually um, joined City Bank as a management associate in 2014. So my very first assignment was in internal fraud where I was focusing on the system development. Then after that, I actually moved to Singapore Cardi Operations, where I was looking into capacity planning, uh, processes, automation, and digitization. And while in the in the transition of completing my uh, management associate program, I was very fortunate to be part of the APEC Leadership Development Program. So this is uh, the program where they allow you to um, move around the APEC regions, three countries, over the period of two years. And my very first assignment, I was assigned to Japan in a transition service team uh, as we actually sold our consumer business to a local bank called Sumitomo Bank. Then right after that, I actually go into my second assignment, which is uh, in India, in a function called Global Decision Strategy, where I was looking into artificial, artificial intelligence, uh, APIs, uh, machine learning, and also um, blockchains. And after my completion of my second assignment, I go into my third assignment, which I was the operations manager for the credit card delivery services. So basically, we look into the end-to-end -end process all the way from embossing to delivery of the cards and also customer escalation as well. So in my current role as a investment insurance uh, sales surveillance operations manager, I'm actually oversighting and also managing a Singapore team. So basically, what I'm actually doing is to ensure that all the all the sales process, um, there's no mis-selling behavior from our frontliners. So, and also ensuring that all the, all the regulatory compliance uh, is actually in place. Um, this is actually very important because like, we needed to ensure that City is acting on behalf of, uh, in the best interest of the customers and ensuring that we are not selling um, the wrong product to the customers. So I think that's pretty much um, what I'm actually doing now. Thank you, Salvia. 
Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, and you only not only manage for the Malaysia team, but you also support a team which is uh, based remotely in Singapore. Yeah, yeah so um, thank you. Now, moving on to you, Arif, uh, if you were to just share with us a little about yourself, please. Sure. Thanks a lot, Samir. Uh, my name is uh, Arif Abdullah from Corporate Banking, and I run the public sector business for City Malaysia. And essentially what I do is uh, I provide uh, advisory solutions uh, to the sovereign uh, government linked companies, your Petronas, your Kazanas of the world uh, on their capital requirements. And that could be both debt and equity. And while there might be a lot of banks out there, I think uh, why we at CTB pride ourselves because we are, you know, we are able to support Malaysian clients you know, in more than 160 countries from all four corners of the globe. And uh, so that's that's uh, definitely you know something that keeps me awake at night as well. So anyway, I've been in in this in this industry for the last uh, well 16 years now. Uh, started in investment banking in what was uh, Commerce International Merchant Bankers, and I've moved into different roles from corporate finance, uh, research. I was a research analyst. I've done ECM, DCM. Uh, so I've been in City now for about eight years, coming to nine. Uh, you know, I get to work on a lot of uh, crude transactions from m and IPOs, bonds, and uh, we've been having a very active year this year. So this year we we did the Petronas six billion dollar bond, uh, the deal that opened up the Malaysian capital market. So very proud of that. Uh, so you know, really keen to share my insights with you guys. So thanks for having me here. Thank you, thank you, Arif. Um, Victoria, over to you. Hi, hi, good afternoon all. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here and to be able to share my experiences with all of you. Um, so I, I have been with the bank close to 10 years now. I joined um, City and City is my first bank. I joined from Accenture uh, Management Consulting. Um, I, I, I think one of the great thing about City for me in the past 10 years is uh, the opportunity to change roles. So in a, almost nine and a half years now, I've managed to get into five different roles and managed to work on seven different countries, uh, all based in Malaysia. And that's one of uh, the great thing about mobility in, in city um, because I, I have family commitment here. So unfortunately, I, I'm not able to be any part uh, of the world. Um, my current role uh, is uh, under cash management, part of transaction banking. And what essentially I do day to day is uh, manage the balance sheet, uh, client solutions, strategizing the product commercializations and covering from liquidity of the client. How do they pay? How do they receive? Um, and the investment opportunities for our corporate client. Um, and, and that's pretty much in a nutshell what I do at a bank. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Um, Christian, last but not the least, over to you. Thank you, Xavier. So really, it's an honor to be here today with my fellow esteemed colleagues. Uh, so thank you, Graduan and City for the opportunity. Uh, I currently work in the credit cards business. Uh, I've actually been there for the past uh, 11 years now, but I've done five different roles uh, in that business. And I joined City uh, fresh out of um, uni. This is my first job. Uh, so very excited to be here. Um, and I joined as a management associate as well, similar to what Steve's path has been so far. Uh, my current role, I'm actually responsible for new client acquisitions. That really means uh, how do we acquire new customers for credit cards and loans. Uh, and it's just across digital and offline. Um, we manage a couple of things from people management to sales management, about 150 people uh, across the entire of Malaysia. We also are responsible for strategizing the business growth, um, running business programs and, and customer programs as to what kind of offers you should get. And of course, the digital onboarding platform, uh, and of course, how the experience goes through for our clients. Um, I also had a one one particular privilege. I was very honored to be chosen for uh, the Global Talent Development Program. Uh, I went over to New York in 2018 for six months. So those are the kinds of opportunities that you get in city. It's really that global. Uh, so I was, you know, really really fortunate to have been on that program. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, um, Christian. So for those of you who are listening to us live, I know you have an opportunity via the chat 
uh, to be able to ask us questions uh, based on the intro that had been given by my fellow colleagues. You'll be able to see that we have got all five of them with a very diverse background. Um, you know, somebody who supports UAT testing within the anti-money laundering pop, um, you know, division. Steve, who looks fairly young, but comes with uh, immense uh, years of or immense experience uh, managing uh, Malaysian or Singapore uh, employees. Arif, who's worked with uh, Petronas, uh, some esteemed um, organizations in Malaysia, Victoria having gone through five different roles in her short span of time, and Christian who does um, uh, manage new acquisitions of new consumer um, client acquisitions. So do um, have questions coming, we'll be more than happy to address them as they come along. Now, um, thank you so much, um, guys. I know um, uh, this news is, you know, what you've shared today probably it's not entirely new to me, but I'm sure it's very um, uh, interesting uh, for the ones that are listening to us today. Uh, going back to the uh, topic of the the topic of the panel today, being navigating your career through a pandemic. Um, like we had started the session by saying, this is a new norm. Um, you know, if Malaysia is going through it, um, at different parts of the world, everybody in you know the whole world is perhaps going through it. So, if I were to ask um, each of you uh, to be able to share one challenge that you have uh, perhaps experienced in the current pandemic, and um, what were some of the steps that you have taken to overcome that, uh, whether it's you, whether it's with your team. Um, perhaps, Arif, I could start with you in order for you to share with us first. Arif, over to you. Sure. Uh, no, I think you've picked a very good question. Um, you know, Sabir, the world has indeed changed. COVID, oil crash, you know, unstable, unstable leadership in the government. I think there's a lot of chaos in the system. And, and I think for once, uh, no one really has a playbook in terms of how to run transactions these days. Uh, you know, we've seen the financial crisis, we've seen the economic crisis, but certainly not, not something like this. So I suppose there's a lot of expectation from our clients on information. And, and these are not just folded information. I think it must be fully analyzed and it takes a lot of work. And, you know, so we, you know, at City, I think uh, we tend to have to be a lot more proactive these days versus, versus reactive, meaning literally we are working around the clock 24 seven. Uh, and that line between work-life balance and wanting to be the best and to win every deal out there is getting really thin. So, you know, just in terms of my observation, I think there are sort of four things that would be key to be successful in this current environment. And I would like to sort of summarize that into four points. I think number one, uh, it's very important to be analytical these days. You know, you, you have to be in the, really in the client's shoes, you know, understand their problems, what keeps them up at night and, and find that solution. We just don't want to be a bank. You know, we want to be a trusted advisor. So someone who, you know, we want to be that banker who the client calls on a Sunday night and say, hey, I've got a problem, right? So I think in terms of, and after thinking, I think that's very key. Now, number two, in terms of use of technology, the thing is, you know, you know, I used to perhaps like spend, you know, probably, you know, at least once, uh, one week out of four months in different countries. So now that we don't travel anymore, we don't meet clients anymore. So what do we do? Uh, so we've got to innovate. Uh, and I think the one cool thing that's come out of this is I get to do a lot more corporate videos this day. So uh, we've got uh, this team down in Hong Kong. So we've, we, we, we do a lot of uh, uh, very cool videos to present to the clients. Uh, so that, that sort of helps. So, you know, technology is key these days. Now, you know, talking about, uh, I think, things which are a bit related to, uh, you know, working with people, I think in terms of self-management, you know, given that, you know, everyone is working from home now, there's no real room for newbies anymore. So every got to, everyone's got to be a lot more self-reliant, everyone's got to be mature. And if you are a new hire coming into this industry right now, you got to come in with your training wheels off immediately and right to the deep end. And I suppose number four, which you know, I think is very important as well, is you, you guys need to really learn how to work with people. You know, I think this thing, this concept about empathy, I think is key. Uh, you know, this year has been super crazy as everyone knows. 
I think people need to realize that, you know, we are just people, you know, for mom, you know, like, like Victoria, for example, to work from home with, with, a, with a baby at home, I think it's not going to be easy. So things are very different. So I think if there's one message that I would like to pass on to everyone uh, in terms of this year is be kind. Be kind. Okay. Be kind. Okay. Yeah? okay. Thank you. Now, that's a good reminder for me, Arif. I'll try and be kind today. <laughs> All right. Uh, Victoria, so, you know, drawing from what Arif had said, and I think he, he made a couple of very good uh, pertinent points about um, empathy. How do we, you know, perhaps support, and, and you are a, an example of, uh, you know, a fairly uh, mother to a very young child. So in your view, what are some of the challenges um, that you have perhaps seen and how, you know, how have you uh, perhaps overcome those if you, if you could share? Sure. I think I'll come from two lines and just writing on uh, Arif's great points. Um, well, a couple of things, I suppose. The, the first point, uh, as a personal individual contributor, as well as a team lead, as well as managing a team of people. And at the same time with my Malaysia responsibility, I also manage five other ASEAN countries uh, in city, so a couple, so many things happening at the same time, and I have a crying baby outside the door from time to time. I, I think it's important to be human about it. Everyone comes with their different experiences, circumstances, uh, and the great thing about city is you know, we acknowledge all this. Uh, our new up and coming CEO, Jane Frazier, she constantly said, it is not one size fits all. Everyone comes from a different background with different needs and we need to uh, come with, with an approach that works well, best with everyone. And, and that's really very helpful. Um, so personally for me, uh, as a as an aspiring leader, and I, I really put my career as, as a front in a lot of things I do, so it's very important for me to have support at home. So it's always, even if I close the door with a screaming baby out there, I know that my, my nanny is taking care of him. I think it's very human to acknowledge that. And my team knows about it. Um, at the same time, um, to be able to engage the team. Uh, all my team members now are working from home. I've been working from home since March. Uh, the challenge is how to continue to engage everyone because I have... I have team members in my team also have screaming babies in the background. How do we continue to support them and have empathy about that? So what we now measure is not about hours. It's not about you locked in at nine and then go off at six. We measure people by their results. So it's important to check in on those results and to ensure those results are in the right path that we want, especially in these circumstances, because there's a lot of distractions, um, whether it's economic distractions, home life distractions, or it could be even interest rate. This year alone, we see so many rate cuts. There are uh, ringgit rate cuts so many times, unprecedented number of uh, times in, within the year. And also there's a huge US rate cut back in March, right? So it's all about balancing that uh, distractions, work, and what is important to deliver the results that we want to see. So that's how, a, a bit of how I prioritize my, my uh task. The other lens that I think um, coming from this pandemic uh, issue is client's lens. A lot of time, um, clients are also, there's another Victoria at client side who, with her uh, potentially young mother. And now that they have suddenly have to switch working from home, their work environments, do they have printers, scanners? And, and so when clients transact with us, the nature of the transaction has changed because a lot of things has to be digital now. So to, we, we need to be very quick in coming out with resolutions, identifying what those needs are, what the client now uh, have to do in this new circumstances and relaying that information quickly to people like RF and, and the coverage and uh, the service team so that they can get the information out to the client. So that's the client's lens as well that we constantly have to um, up our game, constantly have to innovate as well to see where we can do more for them. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, moving on to you, Christian. And if I were to draw some of the uh, pointers that Victoria had made about um, staying engaged with uh, the team and at the same time balancing that out with the clients because like we started the, the session today and we said that this is a new norm. Has we are we in city adapting to it? We do have our clients that are also adapting to it. So what are some of the challenges that you have perhaps faced uh, and how what did you do or you and your team did to overcome those? 
So uh, thanks for that, uh, Savia and Victoria and Ari brought up some really good points. But I'll speak in the context from the consumer side. So um, let me let me talk touch on two things, right? The first thing I think we all know about the the moratorium that's gone on for us, and us particularly on the on the consumer side, this is a big impact, right? So clients had to, or oh, were given the opportunity to go on a six months deferment of all their loan payments, right? But as a bank and being responsible in the spirit of, of what our, our government and also the local regulator wanted to do is really to provide that support for our customers across the entire industry. Uh, and it, it doesn't just boil down to how we do it, but more importantly, it's being proactive, right? We want it to exactly our risk point. We need to provide that proactive engagement with customers. They shouldn't be waiting for information. We should be giving it to them, telling them exactly what to do. And if they have any sort of queries or if they're unsure about how to go about it, they can contact us. We even put out dedicated teams uh, throughout our call center, to our collections team, to be able to support those kind of queries, uh, whether it's about the relief program or whether it's about debt management, so, I mean, that's that's a very key part, uh, trying to navigate through the current pandemic, right? And of course, on the back of that, it's on the staff side, right? The employees of city, uh, being able to provide the support to customers, it's, it's, it's a huge challenge. Being able to mobilize people, putting the right resources, uh, adequate resources to support. We had to pull back some of our people. So the big challenge, at least on my side, uh, from new client acquisitions, one, uh, when the lockdown happened in March, uh, we couldn't deploy our people to sell credit cards at the roadshows. And you know, we have roadshows across the entire nation, uh, in KL, in Penang, and in JB, about 150 of them. So lockdown, right? What can we do? We, we, can't, we can't sell. So there are two parts to it. We obviously had to pivot towards a digital strategy, which is something that we're very big on. Uh, so a lot of our clients, we reached to them on the online space getting them to apply through our website. And we have a fully automated service where the customers can basically apply, uh, get an in-principle approval within a few clicks, and then if they want, they can complete the rest of the application by themselves. Uh, so let me speak about how we then deploy some of our resources to help out with the monitoring side. And that was a huge challenge, right? Because for the first three months of MCO, uh, we really couldn't do much. Right. Uh, there was a lot of ambiguity. We didn't know whether we were able to put people back into the office, whether they were supposed to be working from home. And then when you talk about working from home, we need to make sure that we are catering for information securities because we're dealing with customer PII, right? Personal identifiable information. So in that sense, City is very big on controls. We did what we did to make sure that we put the right people with the right, uh, right um, framework in terms of, of governance. And, and we got that and we will be able to mobilize that as early as June, uh, right about after, I think it was the recovery MCO that came into play. So yeah, so the biggest challenge for us on the staff side, they couldn't work for three months. They literally sat at home while we were working on, on the back to get them to be uh, you know, able to mobilize and repurpose accordingly to help out with both city phone and collections. A uh, huge challenge, you know, because they're obviously very worried about their, their jobs mm. at the same time. But uh, one last thing I'll talk about on the consumer side. We're very big on clients. Uh, in fact, we have this thing called client obsession. You may or may not have heard of it. Uh, it's something that is driven both regionally and globally. Uh, but across consumer, we're big about how we deliver the best experience and excellence to our customers, no matter what. And during this pandemic, that was especially true, right? We recognized mm -hmm. colleagues who were able to step up and provide, go an extra mile to go out of their way to help customers get their transactions done. Uh, whether it's a simple thing like, oh, I couldn't get to my statement, help me out here. We basically got to each and every individual as much as we could, uh, recognizing that. So yeah, that's a bit on the consumer side. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Christian. I think you made a very pertinent point about recognition because as much as we were all un undergoing the pandemic and you made the point about, um, we had employees who were worried about now my my day-to-day -day task is having to sell credit cards and if i can't even be in a mall being able to promote what i do how you know what can i do so there, there was a lot of thought behind how can we do things uh, think differently, which I think um, was very evident. And at the same time, regardless whether they were in able, unable to do that, but there was a lot of other stuff that had taken place that also warrant the amount of recognition that went in. And I think that's that's commendable. Um, moving on to you, Vicky, I think we've heard from Ari, we've heard, we've heard from Victoria, Christian, about a lot to do with customers, clients, and what their day-to-day -day role is to be able to engage with these uh, individuals that are clients of city. In your case, it's slightly different. 
because you may not have um, clients per se, but you do have stakeholders that you support. So um, if you were to just share with us, perhaps what were some of the challenges that you or your team had undergone and what did you do differently? Over sure. to you, Vicky. Sure, thank you, Sadrir. So um, truth to be told, there was no specific COVID-19 crisis handling training. All of us were unprepared, yeah? Employees were unprepared. The announcement of lockdown was uh, pretty much uh, very steep, as in we didn't have much time to work out the logistics, be it from the personal front or from the professional side. But nevertheless, the company's first priority was definitely the well-being of the employees. So with that in mind, we went on full swing, 100% remote working on 18th of March, yeah? And in the first few months, definitely um, everybody was putting in the effort. The accountability was very high. Um, but there was one area that I was actually observing, which is the team morale. It was slightly sliding down. There was, there was a lot of uncertainty due to the pandemic. You know, people were worried about their kids, their family members, the economic uncertainty in the household, and so on and so forth. And naturally, that would actually take an impact on the productivity of the team. And of course, cascades down to the end results, um, as in the output that they deliver uh, to the wider team in the production. So um, the first thing that we had to do is actually to lay out some ground rules yeah, within the team to make sure that everyone is sensitive to each another's needs. And I think it was a, a change of leadership. Uh, naturally, uh, the leaders were supposed to show strength. Uh, we had to show a lot of confidence. We had to empathize, um, you know, throughout this whole pandemic period. And as, as Victoria has mentioned earlier on, there's no one size fits all. Uh, you know, we had to cater to different needs in different mode. Uh, we had to remind the team members, we had to remind uh, everybody that the organization had a vested interest in helping employees' well being. And I made sure that, you know, um, we spot on behavioral change. So probably uh, some kind of mental strains, uh, if indeed it was arising, so that we can actually go in uh, to have a personal conversation with the team members. And uh, thanks to the magnificent uh, infrastructures we have in city, you know, we have got the Zoom, we've got the video conferencing, we've got so many other platforms um, that we are able to connect to the team members easily. And of course, um, look into their well-being, look into the overall productivity, and make sure they're able to deliver uh, without a each yeah 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 thank you thank you uh, we, i like what you had mentioned uh when you started that um we, there was no manual now we all wish there was a manual on how to overcome or manage this i'm sure now all of us are able to write our own manuals uh, i have one i can write a book that's what i keep saying um steve over to you um Anything in addition to what Vicky has said that perhaps uh, was one of one challenge that you had seen that was probably different and, um, you know, and what happens uh, basis of the challenge? Yeah, I think, um, thank, uh, thanks, Alia. So I think Malaysia, City Malaysia actually has done a great job because like, I remember that early of the February when the first COVID virus case has been announced in Malaysia, I think that's a lot of management discussion and a lot of uh, communication from the civilian leadership where we have to move all the users into the cloud. So by the time of uh, the lockdown started, I think majority of the user is already on cloud. So I think that is something that our uh, city actually has uh, embraced through the innovation and through the, to ensure the infrastructure is actually in place. So instead of challenges, I, I would say that uh, this COVID pandemic actually provide the opportunity for us to really look into how we, how we measure the metrics and also how we actually are listening to the people. So to give you a scenario is that because all, all the functions, all the organizations have their own uh, KPIs to hit. So during this COVID pandemic, we might actually really look into whether this KPI is actually necessary. How would that actually impact our employee in the first place? So we actually really look into that. And also we also are given the opportunity where we listen more to the people. Say for example, some people might say that I, I really want to work, but I'm not able to come to the office. So how do we actually facilitate that? So in the sense that, you know, if someone actually come to me saying that, oh, uh, Steve, I don't have a wireless access at, at my home. So given that, now we actually have a process in place where employee can actually reimburse on the wireless um, uh, mobile, mobile device. And on top of that, I think some functions also allow people to actually um, bring, their bring the computer actually going back to the home while ensuring that, you know, the information security all those is actually in place. So I would say this is actually providing uh, more of an opportunity for us to relook into the entire city structure. So, so yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, Steve. I think um, you kind of 
sum, sum it up very nicely uh, based on what uh, the rest of us are, uh, had actually shared in terms of um, there were a lot of things that we perhaps knew that we were we knew how to do, but then this uh, pandemic or this current norm had uh, taught us how to perhaps unlearn a lot of that we knew, relearn and then apply. And then when the next phase comes, you literally have to unlearn it all over again. Yeah, so there we, we are where we are today. But um, with that said, um, and moving on further to sort of like bring the discussion uh, back to you, Arif, and if I were to ask you and, you know, you, how do you, the, the, with the current situation uh, that the world is um, undergoing, how do you, have you seen the approach to work or the expectation of the workforce being different or has it changed in any way in your view? Well, it's, uh, you know, I think in terms of expectation, I think um, it's, it's quite clear. I think, um, um, while, while we go through this crisis, I think it's also uh, a very big opportunity for us to do better. Uh, like I said earlier on, uh, you know, once uh, we've sort of reset, you know, the, the dynamics of the playbook, uh, there's a lot of opportunity that we can work on. So, you know, uh, I must say, you know, given that uh, we've gone through the crisis, but uh, from a business perspective, I must say that, you know, I've done, you know, we've done pretty well this year, I must say, right? Uh, so the question is, uh, shall, can we do better? I think that's something that we always, in city, that's what we always do. We're going to push ourselves further. Um, and, um, you know, I suppose um, in terms of expectations, I think it's quite clear uh, while, uh, you know, some of the competition out there is probably not able to, to succumb to the situation. I think uh, this is definitely the opportunity for us to do a lot more, right? Uh, so uh, in not so many words, I. To, to your question and expectation, I think um, uh, I think now it's it's even greater, I suppose. Thank you, thank you, Arif. Um, drawing from what Arif had just shared, Christian, if I uh, were to ask you, because uh, your role, you basically are in charge of acquiring uh, new clients. So you had shared with us in terms of what were some of the changes that the team has un had undergone. In your view. Do you see clients expect things differently now uh, compared to how it was probably prior to all of this? So absolutely. Um, one good example would be this, and I got to give credit to our uh, product management team. Um, so, you know, each of our credit card, it has a certain value proposition, right? So for example, we have a clear card, which is targeted at the mass segment. Uh, some of you may be holding it. I hope you do. And if you do, please use more of it. I'm, I'm here to promote some of our products, <laughs> shamelessly. Uh, but speaking specifically of that, uh, the, the value proposition used to be something like buy one, free one uh, of, at, Co at Coffee Bean, or buy one, free one at TGV and, and GSC Cinemas, right? Those, obviously, in the pandemic, is not that relevant because people are not allowed to go out. Uh, we're on lockdown. So the product management team did a very good change. They, they, they shifted that value proposition to what's relevant to the customers today towards uh, home deliveries, focusing on Grab, e-wallets when it matters, even Netflix, because we know people are going to shift their lifestyle towards that. And that's the new norm that we're operating in. So um, I think what customers can expect today is that if they're going to get a product from City, it has to be something that they can use in their daily lives that is something that's relevant and valuable to them. So I think, I think, yeah, that's that's what we should be focusing on. Again, customers first, beyond everything else, right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Um, uh, Victoria, so I uh, we do have a question that had came from um, uh, one of our audience. So the question is basically, how would you describe the ideal talent for Citibank? Are there any different qualities that you're looking uh, that you're looking for? So, um, you know, if I could ask you, Victoria, just so that we could address the question, what in your view would be your next great hire and what okay. qualities would you look look for? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, CD is 200 over years, and if I, anything, I, I think the truth in CD any part of the years is uh, change is the only constant. Um, organizationally led change. It's not just COVID and then we change. Internally, CD, we always are looking some form of changes, uh, innovation, so, so to say, so that we will stay relevant in the future state. So the number one quality is to be able to adapt to this 
uh, changes. So agility is very important. I think it's very important to, to the individual to know that, you know, even after a certain role, you have been on a role for X number of years, it's important to know that you, you have to know it within yourself. Is this too comfortable now for me? Is it time for me to change? Because if you initiate that change, it's a way to challenge yourself and test out your own agility skills. So agility is definitely a top of mind for me when I when I look into a, a, a talent. The another thing that I think is extremely relevant when it comes to a, a situation we are in now where everyone, a lot of us are working from home, is visibility. And we have new hires coming, um, whether a new management analyst or uh, interns um, within the department. And you, you have a situation where you have 20, 30, 50 over people in a call. And the, the, the young dudes, I will call it the, the juniors, will tend to listen in than to speak up. That, I think that is a mindset shift that they need to do because I always tell them, I cannot promote you. I cannot hire you if I don't know who you are. So you have to speak up, whether to give an update about, hey, uh, let me share this, what I've done in the past five days. It's very important for you to speak up so they know you. They have a chance to engage with you, to hear how you present yourself in a concise manner so that then we can offer you. If there's a role, if there's an assignment, then we know, hey, top of mind, I remember this person because she or he is willing to speak up in a, in a forum where there's a lot of people. So I, I think very relevant skills these days is to, to step up and be visible. Um, thank you, Victoria. Drawing from what Victoria had said, Vicky, in terms of um, you know pe um, individuals being able to be a lot more agile, like she she used the word speak up. So speak up, perhaps whether it's confidence or whether it's you know just sort of like being able to do so. What do you, in your view, think? Uh, you know, for the, the audience that are listening to us today, that they can start doing now in order for them to perhaps be Victoria's next great hire, for example. Okay, thank you, Sadri, for the question. Um, well, from my view, I think the first thing is for everyone to accept and embrace the fact that we are in a new norm. So naturally, traditional jobs are no longer the same. We must first accept that we must be able to pump up our knowledge in terms of what are the emerging tools, uh, what are the technologies there is in the industry. And, you know, um, we need to actually take one step further from what we have been taught in university or from the theoretical part of our um, experience or, or, or knowledge that has been put across in the last few years. So um, just to set an example, if you're an economic graduate, you need to review data, observe patterns and so on and so forth. But, um, you know, what is important is how to fragmentize those data. So there are a lot of technology. You could use Python, you could use Java, you can use some programming skills to, to, to boost those analysis. So these are um, skill sets that we will probably need to upgrade ourselves and and this naturally uh, speaks about not um, how do I say we never stop investing into your skill set which means naturally use up the net use up the Google um, try to identify opportunities uh, in areas where we could actually you know boost our skill sets and um, most important is of course uh, the area that uh, Victoria has spoken about agility being flexible being open-minded um, yes of course your your um, you know as a graduate or even anybody for that matter our first job has always been preset in our mind but um, because we are weathering a, a pandemic it's it's important that we need to be flexible uh, we choose um, any kind of job that would actually be able to provide us the necessary soft skills for us to maneuver through the industry I think those those are the areas that we should probably look forward to and try to work on to be able to be uh, marketable in the industry yeah yeah yeah, thank you. Thank you, Vicky. I think those are uh, very strong um, points that you have shared with us. Now, um, Steve, you are, um, you know, the, one of the one of the successful products of Siri's leadership program. So I know you were in the program in 2014. Um, based on what uh, Victoria and Vicky has shared in terms of some of the skills that, they, um, that we would advise um, individuals out there to acquire. Is there any advice that you would like to give to some of the audience today that are probably keen and interested in uh, being a part of the leadership program the city has or management associate program? 
So um, I think um, where I am today is because like, you know, City has so much, uh, they actually provide so much trem tremendous support uh, and such as like, you know, mentorship, coaching, uh, peer support. And I would like the audience to actually think City as like, uh, like a Doraemon, not because like, we are actually sharing a blue color. It's more like both of us is actually having a magic pocket. Citibank is actually, um, they actually have um, all variety of tools to actually allow you to build a very successful career. So if I can actually put up a framework for, for the audience, uh, I will want to say uh, it's based on the framework called Beto, B-E-P-U-L. B, start with branding. What is your personal branding? So just now we try actually dimension, you know, people actually willing to actually speak up. So what is actually unique about yourself? If you're actually the first one uh, to hear about the personal branding word, um, so basically who are you yourself? If I actually I ask you a question, what are three important traits about yourself? Can you actually tell me that? So that is the first thing. On branding. Second thing is on the executions. So uh, one of my first manager, which I still connected today, uh, his name is Michael Delph. So he told me that all the problems, you can have the solutions, but without the execution, all plans will actually consider as fail. So executions. The third thing, transferable skills. I know in the audience today, maybe that's a lot of uh, new, new graduates and you might not have any working experience. What are some of the things you have learned during your projects, your assignment time? that you can actually transfer to the corporate world today. Similarly, if you actually have a, a current role, how do you actually transfer those knowledge to the role that you are actually planning to apply for? So just to give you an example, um, recently I just hired one of uh, a lawyer without any financial background. So now she is actually one of my top, top performers within my team itself. So she actually able to demonstrate what are the transferable skills she had in the law firm and put it in the financial institution as P itself. And I think um, B E T U U is on the uplift. How do you actually motivate yourself? How do you actually uh, continuously um, make yourself relevant? This is actually aligned to what we actually shared earlier. You know, we actually have to keep uh, ourselves to remain forward compatible because like, you know, other things keep changing. So as a individual, including myself, I'm actually trying different ways how to actually uh, learn new things. How do I actually ensure that my leadership is actually aligned to CP itself? And finally, for the L, is leadership. Um, in my opinion, I'm actually a very firm believer of um, leading without the title. I remember when I was first like uh, five months within City, uh, my former manager, he actually assigned me to do a presentation to the regional MDs and directors. So that was a big shock for me because I don't have any experience on that. I'm not too sure how I'm going to perform. But give, given that that task is given to me, so I actually uh, take up the ownership. So I want to urge the audience to, um, when anything is given to you, take out the ownership, give the best out of it, and lead the, lead the, or make the changes that you want of how you actually to be here. So I think in short, it's a battle, B-E-T-U-L. B for branding, E for execution, T for transferable skill, U for uplifting, and L for leadership. Yeah, I think that's it for me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm um, very impressed, Steve. Thank you. So for the audience today, yeah. we've spoken a lot, but uh, if you had not uh, taken uh, away some of the things that we've said, all you have to remember is Doraemon and Batol. And uh, those are the skills that you need to be a next great hire. Yes, fantastic. Thank you, Steve. Um, guys, I've got some questions that are coming uh, to, to us. And um, one of the questions that I've just received is, are there, are there more workloads? So is the workload higher for somebody who's working from home and compared to being on site? Um, any of you who would like to take that question perhaps? Christian, okay, Victoria, thank you, yes. Yeah, I, I think um, personally, I think that is uh, more time commitment for me because previously in the office, you know, someone could just walk and say, hey, wait, let's have a five minutes conversation and then we're done with. But now because the person is next, not next to me, the person will probably have to ping me, but I'm in another meeting and then the person have to lock my calendar. And, and, and so it, the whole day becomes so much more longer because instead of impromptu conversations that we could easily resolve, it has to be a lot of uh, scheduled kind of structured conversations. So in that sense, um, the, the time commitment actually increased for me. Mm. Um, having said that, I think that the, the positive point out of it is now that we have Zoom and City, we, we use Zoom as well. So we could see like five to 
20 individuals all in the same space and have to having that face-to-face -face engagement is so much more meaningful in terms of building that relationship and getting things done actually. So I, I do encourage all our colleagues uh, wherever you are, whether you're in banking, in a different industry, whichever you are, I think the face-to-face -face connection, if you can have that, uh, definitely time commitment could be reduced. Yeah, Th so, thank you. Sorry, Sophia, can, I, uh, can I just add to that? That's yes, okay. sure. So uh, I completely agree with Victoria. As to whether workload has increased uh, because of the current situation, I wouldn't say it has. Uh, it's more of... Uh, you know, there's additional stuff to, to what Arif is saying, right? We don't have a playbook to guide us on, on how do we navigate through the pandemic, through COVID and whatnot. But the additional stuff that comes in, especially for people managers, is how do we ensure our people continue to stay productive? Uh, so that's the additional workload for the managers. But for new hires, I would think exactly to Victoria's point, it's spot on. Uh, first, I need to thank our, and do a shout out to the technology infrastructure people. For Without them, uh, none of us would be able to be productive in our current job. Uh, we are able to work from home seamlessly. And I think the big part that has changed is that the hours are so flexible now, right? Typically, when you go to work, you get ready, you drive through a massive traffic jam for half an hour, you get to the office, you start work at nine, you get off at six, so you work those fixed hours, right? Back, back at home, the, the moment you get out of bed, you can start work, right? You know, no one's going to care about how you dress up unless you're going to do a video call, obviously. So uh, I think it's become a lot more, um, the, the flexibility of the hours have extended. Uh, to, to, you know, it may be good, it may not be entirely the most healthy. So it, it all boils down to your time management. I think most of us, I think at least the five of us or six of us on the call, we're quite used to working up to 10 a.m., 10 p.m., 11 p.m., but it's not a necessity. It's not required. It's not something that city expects of you. But just because it's convenient, right? You say, oh, you know what? I don't mind logging in and doing a couple more emails, uh, doing a couple more documents, whatnot. So, so I think in that sense, it just boils down to your commitment to the job. But of course, mm -hmm. it's good to have a good balance on your time especially for those who are parents at home, right? Yeah, and you're absolutely right, right, Victoria and Christine. I think what has happened is it's probably not the increase of workload, but it's just the spread. So I know of some uh, of our colleagues who perhaps log in at 8 a.m. and then, you know, you take for a working mother, somebody like Victoria, she pr perhaps need to take a break during, you know, the afternoon to tend to her child. Um, you know, some of us who probably do our exercise or cycling, like, you know, Arif, six o'clock to, you know, five to seven and so, and then you come back, continue at eight o'clock. So um, I think it's a myth to a large extent, um, you know, uh, perhaps not the increase, but I think it's just that how, uh, you know, some, a lot of you mentioned in terms of flexibility, adaptability, and, and that's really what has come to play a lot, at least personally for me, it has. Um, yeah, so moving on, and I want to just try and see uh, that we address most questions that are coming in. So we've got another question, and this question is uh, specific to the point that both Victoria and Steve had, uh, had mentioned in terms of visibility. So the question is uh, on how can a student increase his or her visibility by industry professionals? In layman, how to get involved in personal branding? So I think the question is a lot to do with, um, you know, to Steve's point, the BOTO, so the B standing for branding, uh, being unique. So how can we, uh, or how can a student perhaps enhance on their personal branding? Um, Arif, you want to try uh, taking that question perhaps? Sure. You know, I think, uh, you know, I think just, just taking into, situ uh, into consideration what's happening now. So, um, Competition out there is it's um, it's crazy, right? Uh, you know, probably some of you wanted to be pilots earlier on, probably rethinking that particular journey. Uh, someone who wanted to be a you know uh, to work in a hotel, probably you might want to rethink that as well. So everyone's trying to get a seat on the table. So you know, I think um, you know in terms of visibility, I think it's very important that number one, you know, pick a sector and you know. Go, go deep in the sector. So if you want to be, uh, if you want to go into investment banking, for example, or, 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 or corporate finance, uh, and, and if you come from a background or you've studied uh, oil and gas or, or you know oil and gas, so pick, pick an entity where you know you can shine in a particular sector, right? So I think it's very important to go in, uh, you know, uh, and really market yourself uh, you know, you've done a lot of work in that particular sector. Um, and uh, while you, you know, you should always market yourself, you are your own franchise, right? Um, 
and um, you know, I suppose uh, get involved with uh, initiatives, perhaps, right? Um, there are a lot of corporate companies out there uh, who open up uh, their doors to, to graduates to do internships, you know, write in, write in early, uh, express your interest to be in, tell them why, tell them why you should be the candidate, uh, you know, make those connections in, you know. I think end of the day, uh, you know, if you're hungry enough, you'll notice. Uh, and there's two, a lot of platform out there that you can showcase yourself. You know, I think you just have to be consistent. You've got to be persistent. You've got to stay hungry, right? Um, and uh, once you've got a seat on the table, I, and I think after that, it's pretty much just hard work. Thank you. Thank you, Arif. Um, we have another question, um, and that's basically as expanding from uh, what uh, both um, Christian um, and Victoria and Arif has mentioned in terms of how do you, or how does one prepare to be resilient? So the question is, what do you think we need uh, to prepare the workforce to adapt and be resilient? Um, Vicky, you want to uh, take a shot at that? So I think um, I think one of the key thing is to be uh, to be prepared to be resilient is pretty much uh, to to be ready as in to be ready to to understand um, the required uh, from the role that we are applying for or even for the industry that we are applying in. So naturally, um, it is important that the individual performs some level of. Uh, um, uh, this is a term that I always use. It's, it's a SWOT analysis. Yeah, you you study your strength, you study your your weaknesses, you study the opportunities that are there in the, within the sector, and you study the area that uh, you think that you need to probably improvise. So this would actually provide you an avenue to understand your individual strength and also the level of areas that you would probably need to um, you know elevate in terms of that, uh, in terms of um, the soft skills, the the um, technical skills, and so on and so forth. So um, these. So these are things that probably an individual would need to study first before being able to, to seep into any sectors for that matter. And as Arif has pointed out very clearly, um, you know, um, it is not necessary that um, every industry uh, would be facing a, a challenge. There are industries or rather uh, sectors which are booming. Uh, make use of the situation and, and try to venture into those. But um, study your skill sets and, and study what are the emerging opportunities there is for you to adapt and embrace and to up, upskill yourself. You know, so th these are very important things that I believe uh, one should really understand within themselves before um, even stepping into the the um, uh, interested sectors. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Vicky. I mean, I I would personally also think, and you made a good point about understanding oneself. I think the more we are able to understand uh, ourselves and what are we looking for, then uh, because. The ideal situation is one can't be resilient all the time. I think the key word that uh, Steve had used, which I'm a big fan of, is adaptability. It's being able to adapt to your situation. So one can be resilient in one area today, but you know maybe not in a different area. So how do you then adapt and make the best out of that situation? I feel okay. Um, I it's good that we have got a couple of question, a couple more questions that are coming. So one of the questions that I've just received this, would you consider engineers or other degrees and not banking or finance to be in your team? Now, Steve, I'm going to do that to you. I'm going to address that question to you because you hired a lawyer who doesn't do anything to do with law in your team. So please help us, uh, you know, give a bit of insight in terms of can people with an engineering degree or other degrees be a part of banking? Yeah, of course. I mean, like, like this actually ties back to like, you know, the transferable skill. What are the things you can actually transfer from what you study to your current role? So I have met a lot of seniors or different variety of people. They have like background of history, law, uh, engineer, chemical engineering. So variety of them and even like psychologists as well. So so to your to, to your question, I definitely agree that, you know, we don't look at just the degree itself. It's what are the things you can actually bring to the table. So what are the things and that required to align to what you want to achieve within your own personal and also professional development as well. And, and if you don't mind, let me add on a little bit to that. Um, I come from a comp science degree. Uh, my previous department has engineering degree. So I, I, if anything, I think I would actually prefer a non-typical kind of a BA kind of thing because it gives a different perspective. I think diversity is definitely key to a successful team to complement each other. So definitely 
all all degrees are welcome in my yeah. view. And, Spot on, Vic. I've got a I've got a chemical engineer on the team. Uh, he's good with numbers. I'll definitely hire another one. You know, if if I have the opportunity, for sure. And I, and I would like to add on to that as well. I've got people with masters in HR, business administration. I've got civil engineers. I've got biotechnology grads who are sitting and doing testing for AML. So naturally, it is not what the degree holds, but rather the attitude to actually learn. Uh, adding to that, so I, I'm I'm personally an aerospace engineer uh, by by degree, uh, and I chose finance because it was you know. Uh, well, back in the global financial crisis, and thankfully, City was willing to hire me. And uh, I mean, uh, I, I'm quite fortunate to have a pretty decent career so far. So yeah, all walks of life. Yeah, thank you, Christine. You know, I was just going to come to you because I, I I knew the degree you have. Yeah. So um, I think we are pretty good with time. So we are about uh, at two fifty seven, and I don't have uh, any other questions that have um. Uh, been asked for us, for us. So with that, um, any one of you perhaps have uh, parting words or an advice that you would like to leave your audience with today? Yeah, so um, maybe I could say start off, Sadhvi. Sure, Wiki. Yeah, so I think, um, thank you so much for this opportunity. And I think um, the advice that I would like to share across is that to everybody who's listening in today, is seize the opportunities which you see in the job market, be flexible with your long-term plans um, and make the necessary small adjustments to actually, uh, you know, uh, to see the variety of, of um, job opportunities which are there in the market and make use of your time. Uh, don't stop learning because if you stop learning, you will stop growing. Yeah. So that's a very important uh, message in, in terms of being successful in any career that you choose. Um, so last but not least, uh, I wish everyone good luck and uh, do take care of yourself during this pandemic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Vicky. Um, just uh, before we move on to um, the other person, we just have got one final question that have come in, which I think it's a pretty apt question as we close the session. Can each of the panelists describe recruitment in 2020 in one word? So maybe let's go uh, around and, and ask then, Christian, if I can start with you, how would you describe recruitment in 2020 in just one word? Recruitment in 2020, did I hear so, that right? Re re yeah, so recruiting somebody in 2020 in one word. Oof, uh, 2021, since we are end of 2020 already. I feel you need to come back to me. I need to think this through. <laughs> let, let, okay. let, me, let me start. Let me start. Yeah, uh, three enjoyed. words. Three words. Sure. Plug, plug and play. Oh, I like that. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with that too. <laughs> plug and play? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I, I will go with dynamic. Okay. All right. Steve, do you have one word? Uh, exciting for me. Exciting. So somebody exciting. Was excited. Yes, somebody's okay. excited. Yeah. Victoria? I, I think it, top of mind is innovative. The way we present ourselves, someone at home, you have to be very innovative in the way you, you stand up because it's via video now, a lot of it. Sure. Innovative. I'll, I'll just add to that, so if you don't mind, if I, I'll sum it up to three words, uh, or two words rather, care and resilience. I think, I think resilience is still going to be the topic all the way. People still need to continue being able to change and accept mm -hmm. change in, a, in the most positive manner. It's about your mindset, right? If you come in, whatever degree you have, it doesn't matter. As long as you have the right mindset to change and adapt, and exactly to Victoria's point, agility is key. So, and, and why care? If you care enough for anything that you do, you will deliver the best performance. It's right. care. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, thank you. I think uh, we have more than five words, but uh, the request was for one word. That's fantastic. Um, I know we are right on the dot at three. So Wafi, before I hand it on to you, I would like to take this opportunity to thank my fellow colleagues, um, Vicky, Steve, Christian, Victoria, Arif, for spending your uh, last one hour with us. Um, I had fun chatting with you guys and I'm hoping it's the same for the audience that are watching us and a lot of this uh, items or you know information that you've shared today will I'm sure resonate with a lot of us um, and uh, to everybody else that's dialed in today I know we can't see you but I'm I'm sure that you can see us thank you very much for dialing in thank you very much for spending the last one hours with us city bankers um, you know, we've been connected with you the last couple of days. We would want to remain being connected with you, taking this opportunity to tell you to take care, stay safe, and uh, looking forward to more such chats. So, Wafi, over to you. 
Thank you very much, Satvir. I enjoyed that just as much as you did, maybe even more actually. So that was really helpful and insightful. I'm sure all our viewers here at Gradon at Gradon Aspire will be able to navigate their careers better through these times. Do visit City Malaysia's booth here at Gradon Aspire and keep up to date with the latest happenings at Gradon Aspire by following us on social media at Grad One, which is right over here. There. Right. So once again, a gracious thank you to the City Malaysia panel, and we hope to see you guys again. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Beyond the basics of deposit taking and loan making for individuals, global banks support companies, institutions and governments. Much of the work of a global bank can be categorised into 1. Helping clients raise money, 2. Helping clients invest and grow, and 3. Helping them to manage their financial risks and flows. When a client needs to raise money, for example, to invest in a new business idea or modernise an existing operation, a bank can help them access funding they may choose to go to the capital markets. Here, global banks are able to connect those looking to raise capital and those looking to invest. Investors might be other banks, pension funds and asset managers who are looking for a return on the money they hold. Money is raised and transferred in a number of ways, but the key methods are as stocks, a share of the company held by an individual or group, and bonds, a fixed term loan agreement between both parties. Where these financial instruments are created is called the primary market. Investors may constantly revise the stocks and bonds, the assets they hold, depending on their performance. Where they are sold or traded is called the secondary market. Here, global banks also play a role in connecting buyers and sellers and will help clients with investment decisions that safeguard assets and maximise the financial return. All successful companies are looking to adapt and grow to protect and enhance their financial future. Global banks have a vast amount of knowledge and expertise that can help them. The bank's job is to advise the client and provide them with insights and ideas that can help them plan for the future. This could be advice on restructuring, buying or merging with other companies, diversifying and future-proofing their business. As a client business grows more global and complex, they rely on banks to manage and simplify their financial flows. That extends to help with the complexities of operating and doing business internationally. A bank that has a global footprint is able to manage their financial interests more effectively and give clients a complete picture of their financial risks and health. So these are just the basics of how banks work. To find out more, visit citigroup.com.